Good morning. We welcome you all to our service today. This is the second Sunday after Pentecost. See, we've now entered what is known as the second half of the church year. First half of the church year is sometimes called the festival half. That includes all the special days regarding our salvation, Christ's birth, Christ's death, his resurrection, and then the sending of the Holy Spirit to guide us in our way. That is a section that deals with the life of Christ. It's probably the best way to say it. That runs generally from December until May or June. And then after the Pentecost and after our Lord has ascended into heaven, the church year changes a bit to reflect now the life of the church or the life of you as a child of God redeemed in the blood of Christ. So we have the life of Christ in the first half of the year, the life of the church or the life of the Christian in the second half of the year as he responds then to the salvation that the triune God has provided for us. So note that in the weeks that lie ahead, especially the gospel lesson, you'll hear similar stories like you've heard throughout the year in regards to Christ as our Savior. But the emphasis begins to turn just a little bit to say, how do you react to this? How do you live your life now to his glory and to the good of his kingdom? So that is the thought as we go forward now into the Pentecost season. Also, at the beginning of this time period, we're going to run a sermon series on a couple of the chapters of the book of Revelation, chapters two and three. We began it a little bit in our Sunday Bible class, but we'll utilize that in the sermons. Those two chapters are letters that were written by the Apostle John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the seven churches that were in the seven cities of Asia Minor. You would know that Asia Minor aspect as uh, the, the modern day land of Turkey. And uh, there's some very interesting thoughts there. I think of it when I read these letters as, what is the Lord saying to me and to my church as to what kind of people we are to be? So that's one of the themes. What is the Lord saying to me and my church as he writes to us in the seven letters to the seven churches? And he ends each of the letters with the same phrase, listen to what the Holy Spirit, hear what the Holy Spirit has to say to his church. Part of the reason for choosing that this year, we've just come through two years, a little bit more of this COVID virus and of other problems that are plaguing our country. It's plaguing the churches as well. It's plaguing the people of God wherever they might be. And it might be good for us just to sit back and listen once again what the Lord is looking for me and my church. So those are the thoughts that will take our attention over the next seven or eight weeks here in the beginning part of the summer season. We also are going to challenge you a little bit today with our liturgy. We're going to be using the second service setting. Now we've done it before and we've tried to practice it a little bit. So we will try to guide you through that. We ask you to be as confident as you can in singing the liturgy as also the hymns that will be used. You have heard them, so maybe you will recognize it a little bit more. And we'll try to introduce these different parts to you through the service so you know what's coming ahead of time. So this morning we begin then with the singing of our opening hymn. That will be hymn number 561. 561. If you feel confident enough to sing through all of the stanzas, please join us. Or you can just listen as uh, Jane, the organist, will play all the way through the, uh, the hymn itself to begin with. And then uh, singing of stanza one, and you can join in on stanza two uh, if you feel that uh, you're confident enough to sing along with us. I think you'll like this hymn. I think you'll like many of the new hymns that are here.
Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and in But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we take a moment to reflect on those words. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue on page 174 with the Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and the praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We continue with the singing of glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest, and the peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and the Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Glory to God in the highest, and the peace to his people on earth. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right 
hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and the peace to his people on earth. We continue on page 178. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to destroy the works of the devil and protect us poor people against such an evil foe. Uphold us in all affliction by your Holy Spirit, so that we may have peace from such enemies and remain forever blessed. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. And we now turn our attention to the scripture lessons that are for today. If you care to follow along, you'll, print, have the, you'll find them printed on the back side of your bulletin. This morning we're going to, because of the reading of the book of Revelation, parts of it, we're going to skip over the Old Testament lesson, but I wanted you to be able to have that in front of you. Perhaps you could read that at home and see how the Lord calls upon his Old Testament people to be his witnesses in the world because those who follow idols have nothing to witness and testify to because an idol does not exist in reality. Our thought today is proclaim how much God has done for you. So we'll begin with the second lesson this morning. From the epistle, Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 to 10. 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul writes. He is in prison. He is awaiting what he knows is going to more than likely be his end at this time. And he writes to his good friend, his young companion, Timothy, who is a pastor now back at some of the churches where Paul had uh, begun his work. And he's encouraging him and he's counseling him on how as a pastor he should guide the church. We begin in chapter 1 at verse 3. I thank God whom I serve with a clean conscience, as my ancestors did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. When I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I remember your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am convinced that it also lives in you. For this reason, I am reminding you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a timid spirit, but a spirit of power and love and sound judgment. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, join with me in suffering for the gospel while relying on the power of God. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. 
and it has now been revealed through the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The word of the Lord. You may remain seated as you turn to page 179. Just before the reading of the gospel, we give the gospel acclamation that reminds us of the thoughts of this season and of our praise to the Lord. Again, you have heard this, uh, you who are our members, but uh, again, we'll sort of introduce it to you. Jane will play through the alleluias, which is the refrain to begin with. I will sing them once, and then I'll ask you to join in the singing on, of the Alleluia's in the refrain. I will sing the seasonal verse with God's word, and then if you would join me once again on the refrain. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Your words are my joy and my heart's delight. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our gospel lesson today is recorded in the book of Luke, the 8th chapter, beginning at verse 26, in line with some of the other thoughts we've had in the, both the prayer and the second lesson for the day. Uh, Jesus wields his power against Satan here, and so there's no reason to be afraid. But as he says to the man that he heals at the end, now go and tell others the good news of what I have done for you. We read in Luke chapter 8. They sailed down to the region of the Gerizines, which is across from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, a man from the town met him. He was possessed by demons and for a long time had not worn any clothes. He did not live in a house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What do I have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. In fact, the unclean spirit had seized him many times. He was kept under guard, and although he was bound with chains and shackles, he would break the restraints and was driven by the demon into deserted places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? He said, Legion, because many demons had gone into him. They were begging Jesus that he would not order them to go into the abyss. I heard of many pigs, a herd of many pigs was feeding there on the mountain. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. The demons went out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When those who were feeding the pigs saw what had happened, they ran away and reported it in the town and in the countryside. People went out to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet. He was clothed and in his right mind, and the people were afraid. Those who saw it told them how the demon-possessed man was saved. The whole crowd of people from the surrounding country of the Gerizines asked Jesus to leave them because they were gripped with great fear. As Jesus got into the boat and started back, the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and tell how much God has done for you. Then he went through the whole town proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, o Christ. 
The congregation may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn. That will be hymn 714, Jesus, Your Boundless Love to Me, 714. Grace be yours and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, if you wish to follow along in this lesson, the Bibles and the pews in front of you, I think they'll all be about on the same page. This is on page 867, way at the back, way at the back. Revelation chapter 2, just the opening verses 1 through 7. But even before I read that, I'd like to tell you a story, true story. One day, a man approached Charles Spurgeon. Now, if you don't know who Charles Spurgeon was, he was a very celebrated English preacher of the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century. That man approached Spurgeon, and he asked, is your church an ideal congregation? I am looking for the perfect congregation to join. 
Spurgeon thought for a moment, and then he replied, no, I'm sorry to tell you we are not a perfect church. We're not probably the one you're looking for. But if you happen to find such a church, I beg you not to join it, because you would surely ruin it. I thought I'd give you a second to think that one over. <laughs> you know, when it comes to church membership, many people are looking for the perfect church to join. Maybe they don't say it that way, but that's what it appears to be. Now, if that man had come to Zion Lutheran Church, would he have found the perfect church here? No. I think he might have been disappointed here also. He would have found people who love their Lord and love God's word. At the same time, he would have found prodigal sons and daughters who wander at times from the Lord's path. Here he would find saints washed in the blood of Christ, their Savior, by faith in him. But he would also find sinners as well. So we would have to conclude with Spurgeon that ours is not the perfect church either. There's no such thing as that on this side of heaven because here we are not yet perfected. But there are congregations that can serve as good examples for us of the way that the Lord wants a church to be. Likewise, there are congregations that serve as examples of the way we ought not to be. That is what the seven letters to the seven churches, which make up the beginning part of the book of Revelation, uh, help us understand. Now, will we find ourselves in one or more of these letters? Probably. So may we heed our Lord's admonition that comes at the end of every single letter that he had written when he said, hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So today we hear what he said to the church in Ephesus. Now you might go home this afternoon or sometime this week and read in the book of Acts around chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That's where Paul's journeys were taking place, his missionary journeys. And he especially came to the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor for a time. You could also read the letter to the Ephesians. It's one of the only specific letters of Paul that we have in the New Testament time that is involved with one of these seven churches. But we'll hear what he says to the church at Ephesus. And this is now from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen, Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So when... The Lord had John write this letter to the Christians that were in the city of Ephesus. The church had been firmly established. It was older than our congregation. It was probably about 45 years old at this time. During that time, it had developed some very good Christian virtues. But some bad ones had also crept in. Now, Jesus began by describing himself here as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. 
In the chapter before this, the first chapter of Revelation, we learned that the seven golden lampstands stand for these seven churches. And the seven stars that Jesus holds in his hand stands for the pastors, the leaders of the congregation. The assurance that he was giving here with that picture of him, the lampstands and the seven stars, was that the Lord was with his people and his pastors. He was surrounding them and supporting them and guiding them and protecting them. Just like Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Well, think of what a comfort that is to Christians everywhere, not just to this congregation, but to every congregation. I'm sure that the pastor and the people in Ephesus were really glad to hear this, for Christians are to be a light in the world, bearing the light of Christ's salvation out into the world that is darkened by its sin and unbelief. It's challenging, but to know that the Lord is standing by you and he is moving among us, directing, guiding, and holding you in his powerful hand, that is a great comfort. Who wouldn't want to hear that the almighty and gracious God is holding that person in his hands? Especially in troubled days, like in which we live, when wickedness seems to have almost free course, not just in our country, but all the way around the world. In the midst of the anger and the turmoil that swirls around us today, his promise stands, I am with you always to the end of the age. Dear friends, he walks among us. Now, as he walked among the Ephesians, on the one hand, he was pleased by what he saw. His omniscient eye that was described earlier as blazing fire saw their hard labor. These, this was a hardworking group of Christians founded by the Apostle Paul, instructed by Timothy, and then established later on by the Apostle John. Their pastors and their people preserved and persevered in the faith that was taught to them. Bearing up under persecution and the hardship that the Roman Empire put upon them, they remained strong on doctrine. They were working hard for the truth of God. They would not tolerate wicked nor immoral men. They would not put up with false teaching apostles, as some men claimed, as though they were sent especially by God when they were not, nor would they follow the sinful practices of people like the Nicolaitans, of whom we don't know much. They were people that seemed to say, Christians that seemed to say, since Christ has forgiven all our sins, just go out and live your life as you want to. They stood against that, and Jesus commended the Ephesians for that. Think about this. Do we work hard for the truth? Are we non-tolerant of false teaching and evil lifestyles that go contrary to God's word? Sometimes when Christians are working hard for that truth, they can be called unloving and intolerant by others. And if Christians refuse to put up with sinful ways or prefer not to work with other groups that don't accept the Bible's teachings as Christ gave them, sometimes they're even looked down as unloving. But when Paul founded this congregation, he instructed them to speak the truth, do it in love. They spoke the truth about sin, about error, and they pointed to God's grace alone that comes to us in Christ as the way out. Christians do that, not because they are unloving, but because they love their Lord and they rejoice in his word that alone can save them. They love people too, not wanting anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance, not to walk in sin that leads to unbelief, and eventually eternal damnation. So they work hard for the truth. 
And the Ephesians, strong on doctrine, persevered in the face of hardships that was thrown at them. And so must we. Wishy-washy tolerance of false teaching that compromises the truth of God is not pleasing to the Lord. It harms souls. It doesn't help them. And it can destroy them in eternity. See, the Savior wants his church to remain strong on doctrine, working hard for the truth, God's truth. So he encourages, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear to the church in Ephesus, and then through them to us. Yes, Jesus commended the Ephesians for their stand. Yet they weren't the perfect congregation. In fact, their hard-working nature seems to have taken a bad turn for which Jesus now scolded them. Yet, I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Now think of that. Forsaken your first love. What could that mean? Perhaps a good way to put it would be to say, you have forsaken the love which you had at first. Something had happened. Their love had grown cold. You know, that's a sign of the end times that Jesus spoke of just before his crucifixion when he said that the love of most will grow cold towards the end. That's a sign of the end that makes me shudder at times. I picture it as a nice warm fire that's being drowned out by a bucket of cold water that's thrown over it. If people's love and concern for God and then for their neighbor is snuffed out, what chaos and harm will result? Years before this, when Paul was still alive, he wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, have love for all the saints, continue to be rooted and established in love. But something had happened. The warmth of their love for the Savior had grown cold. And as a result, love for the neighbor had grown cold too. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan? How the priest and the Levite were walking down the road to Jericho and they came across this man who had been beaten up and left for dead by robbers in the middle of the road. They left him on the roadside to die. And quickly they went around him and turned their heads away because they didn't want to get involved. And these were church workers. How could one leave a person lying in such a wretched state and not help him? Oh, that's love that has grown cold. How can that happen? <laughs> Jesus doesn't really explain that here. Maybe he just wants us to think about how that could be possible in our own lives. <coughs> Do you remember what it was like as a child? When you were a child, or perhaps you watched children, grandchildren, whomever it might be, first time they go to church or when they're young and going to church and they hear the Bible stories in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and then at home perhaps as you read it to them and they can't wait to hear more and they're eager to hear more and after hearing the stories they run out to tell their parents and everybody that they can think of uh, the things that they had just learned well does such an eagerness and a hunger for God's word still lie within you today? Are you as devoted to hearing the gospel as you once were? Taking the sacrament, studying his word, going to church weekly to praise him for his boundless amount of grace and blessing in your life? Or are you perhaps a little careless, non-committal, self-centered in your own living? You know, if we were totally truthful, each one with ourselves, we would have to say that things could stand an improvement in each of our lives and in the life of every Christian within the church. So it is that the Savior calls, whoever has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. 
Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. See, we need to repent and to return to our first love, which is Christ, to deny ourselves, to pick up the cross and follow him, no matter what's going around us in the world today or what's affecting us. Oh, we've got plenty of good reasons to repent and return to him and be his people in steadfast love towards him and others. Don't you love him? If he died for you and he freed you from your sins with his own blood and he made you a kingdom and priest to serve God in his kingdom, as John wrote in the first chapter here, how could we fail to love him? And if we love him, won't we seek to please him? And if we seek to please him, won't we strive to obey everything that he has told us? Yes, we will, because the love of Christ compels us. His love drives us onward, his redeeming love. And how shall that happen? By hearing what the Spirit says. Thank God for that Holy Spirit, whose presence we just celebrated two weeks ago on Pentecost, his presence in our lives, for he leads us to such a life of repentance and faith as we hear God's word. He rewarms that love for Christ and his people that is within us, and he enables us to work hard for that truth. With ears that are open to him, he will not allow that lampstand of God's grace to ever be taken from us. Then one day, as we fall asleep in Jesus here, we shall wake in the garden of God above. That's what the word paradise means. It means a garden. It takes our thoughts back to Eden, doesn't it? In the very beginning, when Adam and Eve could eat from all of the trees that were in the garden except for that one. And God walked and he talked with them in the cool breeze of the evening. And then it jumps our thoughts forward to Golgotha, when our Lord Jesus turned to that broken man who was on the cross next to him, and he said, today you will be with me in paradise. Paradise. Doesn't the sound of that make you long to see it, to wonder what it is, to be near him who created you, who redeemed you, and wants to draw you to himself, where perfection does reign, and you can eat from what he calls the tree of life and never die again? Well, that tree of life is Christ himself. Forever in God's garden called paradise. God grant that we work hard for the truth, that we remain warm in our love, and in steadfast faith then overcome everything and all the things in life through daily repentance and faith. For Jesus' sake, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you would now take out your hymnals and turn to page 180. Page 180. We join with all Christians in confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated, but please keep your hymnals open and turn to page 182. As before the offering, we join in the prayer of the church. Page 182. Eternal Lord, give us peace as we ponder the good news that you forgive our sins in Christ. Lead us to see clearly the path you have laid out for us. Work in us so that we believe and live the word we have heard today. Provide courage and compassion to all who preach and teach your word. Fill them with a love like yours as they proclaim your grace to us and all people. Move us to love all ministers of the word wherever they serve. Guard and guide the families of our congregation. Lead husbands and wives to love each other with commitment, respect, and patience. Help parents to grasp the eternal value of keeping their children close to Jesus all their lives. Grant joy to those who are single and make them a blessing to others. Protect us from the temptations that surround us. Give us pure hearts and minds. Provide wisdom and insight to those who make laws and set policies. Give us respect for those who protect us from crime. Lead us to value the rights of our fellow citizens and to defend those who cannot defend themselves. Bless our land with peace and prosperity so that the gospel may be proclaimed to all. Give us passion to share the story of your love with our family and friends. Overcome unbelief and open the hearts of people everywhere to believe the good news that Jesus has forgiven their sins and opened the gates of heaven. Fill us with joy over every sinner who repents and comes to trust in you. Extend your healing power to all who are sick and suffering in body or mind. Give patience and compassion to all who care for the sick and dying. Lift the eyes of the distressed to your love in Christ. And now hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. And on this day, O Lord, which we in our land celebrate the gift of fathers whom you have given to us, we thank you for providing us with them. The care they give and the compassion they show are a reflection of your love. Help them in their most important work of bringing up their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. Let your grace and forgiveness always be at the heart of their family leadership. Strengthen them to model for their children a godly life and bless all they do to provide for the needs of their families. Gracious God, you govern and direct all things, and you love all people. Hear our prayers, spoken and silent, and answer them in your wisdom and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And we now worship our Lord in bringing our offerings to him.
We give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be. All that we have is thine alone. A trust, O Lord, from thee. Lord, you have richly blessed our lives in so many different ways, within our families, within our homes, uh, within our church. We ask that you would always be with us, as you have promised, that you would walk among the lampstand that is here at Zion and everywhere throughout the world. And as we bring our offerings to your altar today, we ask that you would bless them to your glory and so that the gospel might be preached throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you would now please rise and turn to the sacrament portion of our service, you'll find that on page 183. And I told Jane before the service that we would probably speak this part because we have not actually gone through it. But you are singing so well today, <laughs> these new sections, that Jane, we're going to be singing uh, this opening portion too, okay? Okay. All right. The Lord be with you. And Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power, God of might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And we join in the prayer the Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, 
This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also after supper he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is poured out for you for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And now may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Jesus, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Jesus, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. You may be seated as we now invite our communicant members to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Please follow the direction of our ushers. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Take and drink. This is a true blood of Christ, shed for the remission of your sins. And now may this his true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Now may this is true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this is true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.
Please rise. And in returning to your hymn books, if you would turn to page 187 for the close of our service. About halfway down the page, the responses. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now receive with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Again, we welcome all of you to our service today and pray that you've been strengthened in your faith by God's word. You know, you sing pretty good. <laughs> Tell me, was it okay? It was okay. It was okay. <laughs> good. Yeah. It's, to me, what's I, I, I miss the old things because I grew up with them, all right? But I also love the new things because it's actually not new. The words are pretty much the same with the same thoughts. New, new music and that at times, though, makes me concentrate a little bit more. Um, because, you know, when you grow up, you do things over and over and over again, and it's just by rote. And when you have something new, uh, that helps you concentrate a little bit more. And I do love the music that, that has been there. So thank you very much. You must have been singing this before. No. No, you haven't sung this before? Okay, all right. Well, then, Jim, it must have been you back there. <laughs> Someone was leading over here somewhere, so that was very good. Um, you did very well. Thank you very much. Uh, you've only heard that a couple times, but uh, I, I, I think you'll enjoy it as we get further along. Um, in your bulletin today was an insert that uh, gave a little bit more information about the church or the city of Ephesus. If you haven't had a chance to read it, you might look at that as you go home. And as I mentioned, over the next couple days or so, you might look at the book of Acts and see how Paul dealt with the city of Ephesus in the beginning as he came as the missionary to it. Um, and also read through the book of Ephesians to give you more insight as to that. It, it helps us in our own lives of faith. If you haven't picked up a meditations booklet uh, for this month yet, there's still some in the back, also the forward in Christ. And um, God bless your day and your week that lies ahead. Fathers, have a good day. And uh, we'll ask the Lord's blessings upon you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.